Welcome back to Your Finance TV and a look at the week ahead for you. As usual, we've got Brendan McCarty back from Column A. How are you, Brendan? I'm good. Good morning to you. <laughs> morning to you too, buddy. Now, before we jump into the show, don't forget to click on that subscribe button and the like buttons to stay up to date with all of our shows on Your Finance TV. The jobs report this week is going to be the focus so to see if the Fed has their finger on the rates higher button. I think they've made it pretty clear that they are going to be doing that, but we will see. Thursday, the White House will announce a proposed budget, so keep an eye on the defence and infrastructure stocks on that front. You'll see so much commentary on that this week, so we're, not, we're going to avoid that. We're going to focus on some of the things that are a little bit under the radar. Friday, we interviewed Matt Tuttle and his new Jim Cramer ETFs, SJIM and LJIM. Make sure you go check out that interview to learn more about those. But Brennan, did you know that there's been more ETF closures this year than new ones? I did not know that at all. <laughs> okay, well, think think about it a bit deeper then. Do you think that we've seen the peak of ETF, ETF interest now? So uh, I don't think it's... I think ETFs are a long-term growth story in that not the ETF itself, but the ETF serve purpose of transparency. Everybody wants transparency. Everybody wants data. Big data, you know, you and I, we all pay for data that goes up every year. You know, it's like the one growth business in financial services is big data. Um, and ETF serve that purpose on a free level, right? So you get that. I think from a growth standpoint, the business will continue to grow over time. In terms of this year, anytime you have a bear market, people exit the market, passive instruments suffer. Um, I bet you if you look at the Vanguard S&P 500 fund over the life of it, you would find periods of time where it falls in terms of asset growth. Um, so that that was like that was the gold standard before we had ETFs years ago. Right. Uh, so I think this I think what's going on right now in terms of launches, you can't make a lot of money on these things anymore. So you have to only make money on the growth of the assets in them. So if they're not growing in terms of assets, well, you know, there's no point in launching new ones unless they're real specialty. And even the specialty ones haven't done super well, I don't believe. Uh, I mean, you see, like, the Jim Cramer ones should be interesting. Uh, it's amazing how many people are actually short those th in the short fund versus relative to the long fund. I don't know if that's an indictment on Jimmy or what. Um, but they, like, you, you're seeing such negativity in the market that it makes sense that they're not launching new ETFs. Um, but the problem, the, the thing with ETFs is, like, when I was managing money at Morgan Stanley, we would use ETFs as a core holding in that, you know, you have your core money that you use over whatever your life life scale is. So if say you're 45 years old and you're going to live to 80, well, you have a portfolio of stocks. The best way to get that exposure over the next 35 years is probably ETFs versus active management in that if you have a 100 clients, it's awfully hard to manage stocks over 100 clients because there's just different stories, different clients who don't like different stocks. So if you're going into ETFs, that gives you, all right, it's an S&P 500, fine. When, rinse and, let's put it over here. And so I think ETFs have gained that exposure. I think mutual funds still remain way too expensive. Uh, and ETFs will continue to hammer away at the mutual fund business over time. Um, this year being down doesn't surprise me. Everybody's exposure is low. Like the NAAIM, so am I saying that right? That thing is, that dropped all the way down to 50% in terms of exposure. Uh, I think it's rising again, but it got as high as 80%, which means institutional investors cut back exposure by almost 50% in the last three months, something like that. Retail's backed off. So if they don't know what to buy in the stock market, they'll go into ETFs. So I think ETFs is going to continue to steal from mutual funds. It probably won't experience the same rapid growth, but it serves a big data purpose. It serves a need. It gives transparency to a market. So while they are more closures this year, and that's probably due to these uh, these doubles, these triples, which are not, they're, dangerous. they're not great vehicles to use necessarily. Um, you can lose a lot of money on them, but uh, it's just specialty ones. And if they're not getting the flows, they don't stay in business. I mean, I think Matt said to me, um, I, I don't know what the level you need is, but you need a good amount of assets to start making money on these things. So if you don't have any assets in your fund, well, you know, you're not in business anymore. So it makes it easy to shut them down. Yeah, I, th I think it's 50 million is the number that needs to be in AUM just to be like a break even sort of level. I, mean, I, if I it's see a story that Invesco is cutting up to 11% of their ETFs this year. But I think a lot of that might be down to the environment we're in for the financial world, uh, whereas cost cutting 
more layoffs and so forth. So I think that might be a bigger part of all of this. And I, I agree with you. That not that ETFs are going to disappear, but it's just a massive part of the industry now that's going to go through the same ebbs and flows of the finance world. Everybody does, right? It's just it's it, It's got such a low cost. You can't make a lot of money on them, so they get cut. And it's probably easily easy to wind down ETF. You know, you just, I mean, or you fold it. I think that's one of these things they do these days is fold them. Yeah. Um, like they used to do with mutual funds. You fold the mutual fund. It, it's no big there. It's a, it's a nature of the cycle. You know, it, if we were down again this year in terms of the markets and that we think so, uh, we'll be, well, the market's doing whatever it's doing right now. But uh, if we still, if the markets were have another down year, you'll see more closures again because these specialty ones will not take in assets and can't stay in business. And then markets start to rally again. You start seeing the specialties come out. There'll be like Jim Cramer's growth stocks and Jim Cramer's value stocks, those two other things. And all of a sudden, you'll have ETFs of any sort. So Matt's probably ahead of the cycle, ahead of the curve on that one. But anyway. Media and ETFs, who knew? Um, I want to stick with the ETF theme here for a bit, though, as they are an interesting way for investors to get exposure to sectors, themes, and countries that wouldn't be as easy to do as like an individually. Uh, so these tools are great for that front. In our interviews with Jay Pulaski on Fridays, he has mentioned for a while now, Europe leads the way for global equities. The largest ETFs focusing on Europe are Vanguard's VGK and JP Morgan's beta builders, BBEU. Both have had a big run, Brendan. Is it too late to jump on the train here? So there aren't too many um, stocks in the world or indexes in the world breaking out, but Europe features two of them. Uh, the IBEX, well, we, we look at three. So... We look at the DAX, the CAC 40, and the IBEX. Um, we used to look at the FTSE, but it's not supported on the platform we use. So we don't use the FTSE 100 anymore. Uh, and it's a volatile index anyway. Um, but in any event, uh, yeah, Europe is the strongest across the globe. But it's kind of curious considering they have a war on the border. Uh, the ECB is a basket case. They basically have no growth. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a conundrum, but they're abnormally cheap over there. I think you're looking at Europe at like 11 or 12 times forward earnings. And you come over here and you're looking at 16 or 17 times earnings. I mean, based on value alone, you would look at the two and say, all right, I, I want to buy a cheaper PE and sell the more expensive PE. Uh, so Europe has benefited greatly. We've been on this. this the breakouts were back in September. Uh, late September was when the divergence occurred, where the U.S. was getting was melting down into the end of September and then the Fed and the BOJ decided to inject money into the world uh, or the BOJ did. Um, and then the Fed decided to ignore it. But uh, that sent Europe into the, the, to the moon. So they weren't trading at nine and 10 times forward earnings anymore. They were trading at, I mean, that's where they were. Now they're up in 11 or 12. So we, I was looking at that. We do a rundown. We call it the rundown every Monday. Uh, and we update our view on this. And the DAX, CAC 40, and the IBEX have all been solidly bullish for the longest period of time. Can't get over it. Uh, even even the developed world is still beating up on the U.S. markets, though uh, it's been more even of late. So the U.S. has finally woken up and probably why you're seeing a rally of late. Um, so th I don't think it's too late based on these breakouts in the IBEX and the CAC. Uh, when, the, the rubber, the risk, the, when the rubber hits the road is when Germany gets to its previous highs. If Germany breaks out, then you're going to see a real run in Europe. If Germany fails... Uh, that's going to make the other two weakling, the other two weaker player, those other two indexes susceptible to a reversal. So, yes, the run is still here, um, but I would watch Germany to see if they can keep going. I mean, Germany's the most exposed to Russia, to the war, to China. I mean, is China reopening? That's the biggest question. So, uh, I would just say, it's the run is here, but watch Germany. Okay, we're going to talk about China shortly, but before that, let's talk natural gas. And this is not breaking news, but the UAE is trying to leave OPEC. And this is more gas related than oil related. Brennan, can you break down more of this for the viewers? And how would you play this from an ETF perspective? So the I, OPEC's always had these splinters. And I love how the UAE ran back to the OPEC saying, oh, we're not leaving. We're not leaving. Uh, because they probably had enough pain from natural gas falling all year. Um, I can't tell you how many people sent me nasty Twitter tweets when I said natural gas looked like a bubble of 10 bucks. And then it fell through nine. And then there was the best momentum trade ever that I just didn't participate in. But hey, no big deal. Um, but uh, the natural gas world, it, it, it's clear, it's looked at as cleaner, right? So you look at natural gas versus energy. 
uh, oil, you say, all right, natural gas is cleaner, better for the environment, quote unquote. I don't know about fracking. I can't tell you about that stuff. But I know that the Permian here uh, and I know that the United States is a big producer of natural gas. We're also a major producer of LNG. So when LNG uh, was needed in Europe during the, the lead up to the winter and we were all afraid that natural that every European was going to freeze to death uh, when, in fact, they had more than enough natural gas to cover their supplies, um, LNG covered that gap. And LNG is a, I think it's another form of cheaper, better environmentally fossil fuel, if you will. Um, in terms of L not the UAE, I think they felt the pain from it. The iron irony is natural gas bottomed last week. I think it hit two bucks about a week ago. UAA was trying to get out about a week ago. That's where I kind of thought, I wonder this is more natural gas related than crude. And because the UAE is like the ninth or eighth, seventh biggest player in the world on natural gas levels. Uh, so that is a big deal to them in terms of money. They're trying to become a bigger force globally. Uh, and I think this is one way to, you know, all right, we're done with this. We have more our future is brighter with natural gas than it is crude. Um, so I think that's why they were pulling what they were doing. Now, natural gas put in a really nice reversal over the past few weeks. I'm not saying go buy or sell it, but I think the massive sell off that we saw of like 10 bucks fell. Um, we're moving into the get ready to next season now. So now we're heating season. Heating season drives electricity, which drives natural gas, or natural gas is used to power electricity. So in terms of natural gas, I think if, you, if this U.S. economy is not falling off a cliff uh, and remains red hot, um, like it, it held all winter and natural gas prices sank, I think you're going to start seeing natural gas actually reverse the other way based on the drawdown in Europe, because eventually they're going to start drawing down. They're going to need more gas. Uh, and you're going to start at $2 a gallon, $2 per PCF or two fifty three. dollars It's still relatively cheap to get to other products. So. I think the way you, the one option to play on this is not necessarily buy natural gas directly, but it's like you look at the MLPs. We were, I was always a big fan of them because uh, they, they're, they're the pipes, right? So if natural gas is moving through the, moving in the economy. Well, why not take a, take a toll rate? You know, why not be there to take a toll? And that's what the MLPs do. So one ETF we look at is the, I, I like to look at, and I've always liked to look at is the MLP. Uh, it's the Alarian MLP ETF. Uh, it's, I think it's got a seven and a half percent dividend. Um, you could sit there, take it, it. It's actually moving higher now. It's, it's held in relatively well as natural gas has fallen, which argues that demand really hasn't fallen. But if demand starts to pick up and natural gas prices start to rise, the ETFs will start to climb. So natural gas is an interesting story now. Um, I don't know if it, stayed, it goes up to seven or eight, nine, no idea there. But it did put it in a state, sort of bottomed last week or two weeks ago. Uh, and I think like an Larry and MLP, the AMJ is a little bit more risky because it's more of a it's more of a K1 fund, I think. So you may not want to be there. Um, that's one option. I don't know if I, I'm not sure I'd go into the UNG. I think that's the upward uh, natural gas ETF. I'd probably avoid that just because it deals with a flow issue. Uh, money, too many flows can distort it. It's kind of hard to play with too. So I think ETF, I think natural gas is a story going forward that's probably a bullish one. Um, level inventory is leveling off. So, and then UAE is saying something. I wonder if there's more to follow in terms of UAE, OPEC, Iran. Iran's a big natural gas player, and so on and so forth. Okay. And now we we touched on China there before, and it's that's another popular theme with Jay Pulaski. And over the weekend, the MPC set the Chinese economic growth for 2023 around about five percent sort of rate. The Premier added that it should be taken as a floor of growth the government is willing to tolerate, which is <laughs> seems a bit threatening to me. But there are many different ways to play the ETF in, in uh, sorry, play China in the ETF space, such as KWEB, MCHI, FXI, GXC, and there's many more. I think there's close to 50 different Chinese ETFs which you can invest in. How would you play China, Brennan? So I'm not... Anytime a China government spits out a number, I sort of ignore it because you can't trust the numbers anyway. Um, five five percent over there is five percent stimulus. I they need they I believe six percent is where they need to grow if they want to keep their people happy. They're not going to ever get there again. They're too big. Um, I don't think they even get the five percent to be honest, unless it's manipulated. Um, China itself, I I've been skeptical on this whole reopening play and. I, Part of it was because the Shanghai comp wasn't moving. 
it was sort of going sideways. It got back to trend after declining for a while. It had a nice move off the lows. So I'm going to be wrong. But so in the Hang Zhang. Like the Hang Zhang, uh, I think we wrote, was the most oversold index ever. Uh, that was in August of last year. I, the RSI reading, with a, our momentum was like a minus 46%. I had never seen anything that oversold ever anywhere. And I think the day we wrote that, the thing rallied. Again, another thing I should have bought when I wrote about it, but whatever. Um, the the Since then, the Hang Zhang shot back up the trend and then is now reversed again. Um, I think the great China reopening play has been played. I think people, I think the global flows went to Hang Zhang. I think it went into these ETFs. You can't really get into China easily. Uh, I mean, this this flow, this talk, this talk out there that they're restricting flows again. I think, um, crap, I put it on Twitter. Uh, there was a money guy. I forget who it is, but he can't get it. Uh, Franklin Templeton. Who's the guy who runs Franklin Templeton? Um, I'm forgetting. Uh, he's having trouble getting money out of China. So China is obviously a little wary about the yuan right now, if it sounds like, and they're not allowing flows going in and out. Another thing that was interesting to me in terms of China was if you look at the Hang Zhang, these ETFs, MC, uh, specifically the MCHI and the GXC, all three of them are correcting right now while the Shanghai comp breaks out. So that to me tells me, all right, mainland China might be doing something, but the ways to play China aren't. So it, I wondered if the, the skeptic in me is the Chinese government just manipulated the index higher because they can do that easily is tell the banks to start go buying. So I don't know if this reopening story is real. I still, I am really skeptical about it. I think you and I talked about this when we came out of the pandemic, you and I weren't running down to Walmart to buy something or target or whatever. We're out looking at people. We're trying to see people. We're trying to get things moving. China is such a huge country. It doesn't turn on overnight. It's just the way it is. The United States took, I think uh, earnings wise here, um, I mean, the stock market rallied because the Fed pumped so much money into it. But if the but if the Fed hadn't done what they did, I bet you the S&P would have drifted back down that 2200 level and not start to rally till the fall of 2020 or even through the elections. So what's that to say on China's reopening? I think I, I think the, the the ETFs, the Hang Zhang are telling you that the reopening is not going as fast as people believe. Be careful what you see in the Shanghai comp. It may not be a real breakout, even though the chart looks great. It is a one. It's the first breakout that the comps had in ages. But the ETFs aren't following through. So why is that? And that tells me there's something lost in translation, I guess. So I would just say if you plan, like we we look at the MCHI. That's what we use for our proxy for uh, for China. Um, and it's under the breath has been wonderful, but that was from the that was from the first wave of investors sweeping in there. Because they had to put the money somewhere over the last several months, and they swept into China uh, right off the lows in October. Everybody bought every asset across the globe in October. Cert, like Europe is not giving up. China is giving up. Uh, emerging markets are giving up. So it makes you wonder what is actually percolating out there. And I, it makes me wonder if this China reopening, they may be reopening. It's like a tree falls in the forest. Is anybody, is it, nobody's there to hear it. it. Does it make a sound? Well, if nobody sees the China reopening because the world can't actually see it sometimes, is it actually reopening? So that makes you wonder. Yeah, there's, listen, there's, there's bulls and there's bears on China. And then there's a lot of people who don't believe the data that comes out of there as well. So Count time this. will tell, Brendan. Time will tell. Yeah. All right, let's move, move on to the last segment for the show. Like it, love it, leave it. Uh, everyone loves it. You've seen the track performance of this. It's fantastic. But it's definitely not a guarantee of anything going ahead. So let's see if we can stay on track this week, Brendan. Uh, we're sticking with the earnings focus. We're going to start with Dick Sporting's Goods, and they report on Tuesday pre-market. Uh, so I like the store, but I'm going to leave the stock. Uh, it failed to break above 135, though it did have a good week last week. So it might re-challenge it, but we'd leave it. I'd leave it. Okay. Uh, Oracle reports Thursday after the close. Uh, nice move. Uh above uh, resistance i like it closed above 88 which was that range um looks like it run to 96. okay one we've looked at before is united natural F foods unfi they report wednesday pre-market hey we did we did a foods week didn't we yeah we, we did. did we did yeah remember that uh you uh, i like it um i'm not entirely sure fundamentally why but i can the chart looks good it held the 65 week looks like a good run Okay, uh, touching back in China a little bit, JD.com, they report Thursday pre-market. 
So just this is a flow, I guess. This not this JD is probably benefiting somehow, but um, I like it. Uh, I had a nice turn on the forty-five level. A lot of the Chinese stocks, like Baidu, turned last week. Bob or the week before, they all turned off with resistance. So support, sorry, they turned off with support, and they're climbing. So I, I like JD. Okay, well, another very volatile name is DocuSign, and they report Thursday after the close. So I'm, I, I said this about Teladoc, that I really like the company, but Teladoc went down. <laughs> uh, I really like DocuSign. I, I just like the whole premise of behind it. It makes the world more efficient, but uh, that doesn't mean I reason for buying a stock. But I like the stock because of the chart. Nice turn on 57. Uh, it is at resistance, so it's like in a little range of sorts. But if it breaks out over that, it should, I think we could see 66. Okay. And the last one we're looking at is Gap, and they report Thursday after the close. Uh, so there's an interesting trend out there of retailers being shorted. I think I mentioned this last week. The short interest is climbing across these stocks quietly, like it was like four to five to six percent. I haven't checked out gaps, but um, I wonder if this is why we're a leave it. Uh, I wonder if the charts and the retailers are starting to roll. Um, it's a theme, it's not a theme. It's just something I happened to notice last week. So we leave it. Uh, it had resistance 65 and then it fell below the 20 week uh so we would leave it um there's some, something developing on the consumer i don't know if the consumer peaked and the shorts are starting to get wind of it um it's not something i've ever tracked to watch short interest from week to week but there's something brewing in this the consumer names i just don't know what it is yeah i'm just having a look here now um short interest is at uh, 14 percent in gap yeah so is it higher than it was last week uh it's a little bit a little bit lower uh, so uh, maybe because the market's climbing, I don't know. I we did we covered some retailers last week, and I was just curious about um, what their short interest was because that's one of our that's one of the things we do in the three L's. If we go over fifteen percent, is you leave it, but you leave it with hesitation because anything shorting anything over fifteen is a really deadly thing, the deadly thing to do because it's dangerous to play with shorts that way or to leave a stock that has a fifteen percent short interest. You sort of like ah. Uh, Maybe not want to leave that stock because it might run you over. Um, but it's just, I think this, uh, it was in the bigger names. Like Target had a 5%, which I thought was surprising. Uh, Best Buy, I think, was in the sixes. I, I just, I should have wrote this stuff down. I, it just, it perked in my eyes. I'm like, oh, it's one of those things just like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. But I didn't do a full study. Um, I Like, I, I probably should look at these guys after Dix and um, all of them to see if the short interest is climbing. Maybe we'll look at the retailers next week. Maybe. <laughs> All right, Brendan, listen, thank you so much for your time again today. Uh, good luck this week out there, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, have a great week, everybody. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.